Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. So I'm in my New Holland TS-115A. That's the tractor I'm driving. No, this is the only tractor I've got, and uh, we're heading out to the field to do a bit of frost seeding. We still got some frost going on down here in southern Ontario. And before that frost disappears and we don't get that weather anymore, I want to get some seeding done. So I just want to overseed some of my fields that uh, last year were wheat and they were underseeded to uh, clover, uh, alfalfa, trefoil, some crimson clover. Um, I even tried some grasses, but uh, last year the grasses didn't really come up. So I want to make sure it's a nice thick stand. And there's also some permanent pasture out there. I'll show you when I get out to the field. Uh, that I want to kind of uh, add a bit of bulk to uh, by overseeding and hopefully a lot of this stuff will come up in the spring. So we're going to go out there. Um, I'm using this, I don't know if you can see it in this light. It's just a little pendulum spreader, three point hitch on the tractor. And uh, we're going to see how that works. And go from there. So there's two fields I got to do. Isaac's in the truck there. He's going to take the rest of the bags that are in the shed there. This is the pendulum spreader I was talking about. I'll give you a better look at it once we get out to the field. So it's uh, not something I usually undertake to do at the end of a Saturday, but farmers don't have the luxury of picking when the weather is best, right? So. I could have done it a few other days, but I just had too many other things that were pressing between lambing and uh, there was also, I had to clean out the barn before the next lambing group started. So those things combined, um, I just didn't get around to doing this. So we're gonna go see about doing it now. I'm going to be doing this while the boys can hopefully do my evening chores. So I sure love having them around. They've become a great help to me and uh, starting to know a lot about how to do things and what to do and what to look for so I appreciate it a lot and uh, let's get out to the field and we'll see what happens I think we've reached a fork in the road I'm gonna go this way There's a big drift there. So this is what we call a pendulum spreader. We've got the seed in there. The seed is made up of tree foil, alfalfa, and red clover. And uh, what's nice about having some snow is you can see how far it goes. I don't know if you can see it, but there's all the little seeds there. And uh, so we're probably spreading at least 30 feet wide, maybe even a bit more, but it's also a bit breezy out. But uh, what basically happens with this spreader is this thing goes back and forth really fast. Isaac, why don't you show them? So as you can see, there's seed in the pipe right there. And as soon as he turns that on, rev it up a little. As soon as he turns that on, it starts, see that? So we're putting it on really heavy there, so I had to shut it off right away. But that's how a pendulum spreader works, and you just run around the field as it's running. The tricky part is knowing how heavy to go before you run out of seed or before you're done the field and you got way too much seed left over. So we're gonna see how it goes. We're gonna do a, around the whole perimeter. I was hoping to have had the seed earlier so that we could get uh, do it all in the snow so we could see exactly where we were going. You can see your previous tracks because I don't have that technology that says GPS, drive here, you know, for straight lines, all that stuff. <laughs> so Isaac's laughing at me, but uh, I don't have that stuff. So we got to make do with what we got the old fashioned way. So anyways, here goes. 
Little seat for Isaac. Here we go. Hang on. back to this I think Monday morning right, yeah we're gonna have to come back to this Monday morning because it's just uh, with the Sun out in the last hour it's kind of just made the whole top kind of greasy and I'm actually making like one inch ruts in the low spots so we're gonna have to stop hopefully Monday morning it's still getting frozen and we can go from there so Isaac's all about his trucks and four-wheel drive and you know mudding and stuff Let's see if he can get up this hill with the pickup truck. Well guys, not only lambs are out of the aisle, they're also outside the barn, enjoying the sunshine. Well, looks like Isaac made it through the gully with the truck. After the last video that I put out, um, where we kind of outlined a few of our lambing problems, uh, we definitely got some feedback on that. Um, some of it positive, some of it not so positive, and I hope that you all took it the right way. For the most part, what we were trying to show was that, yes, uh, things are going really well, but we also want to show that, you know, it doesn't mean there's no hiccups along the way. I think uh, some people kind of had the idea, like, uh, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Like, there's a lot of things you don't seem to be doing. And maybe I didn't explain myself super well. Let's just uh, address a few of those things. Um, so when it came to the pregnancy toxemia on some of these ewe lambs, as you can see, for the most part, they're all in really good shape. Like you take this one right here, that's one of the ones that had toxemia. Really, it's not in bad shape. And I, I'm convinced that probably the main reason some of them weren't getting 100% of what they needed for once, whichever ones of land that had pregnancy toxemia are um, ones that had triplets. So that's a lot for you lamb to be carrying. Um, and my biggest problem I think in this barn is, is somewhat bunk space. So when I'm feeding that grain concentrate, when I'm feeding up to almost, almost two pounds a day to some of these uh, ewe lambs, just because they're still growing and developing somewhat, and because uh, they probably have quite a few lambs in there. So I feel like we've done almost what we could i think the biggest limiting factor is is bunk space and perhaps the loose mineral that we've been feeding has been mainly free choice so one of the things we have changed to address this problem is to mix that mineral directly into the concentrate ration and uh, i have shown you guys on previous videos what we do for feeding but some of you are still asking so i'm just going to show you this is the mix that we make which is basically whole corn. 
mixed with this stuff here. So that stuff in the container right there is called expeller meal. So that's our protein concentrate supplement. So I think it's around 34% protein. So that gets mixed in with the corn to bring the protein levels to a, a better level. It's not just energy, it's also a bit of a protein supplement just to balance out that ration a little better. So I feel like they've been fed well. They're getting this high quality alfalfa hay and they have for the last four to six weeks gotten a pretty decent hay. This alfalfa here is, this particular one is quite grassy, but it's also got um, young grass and a lot of alfalfa. So I'm pretty sure, though I didn't get this hay tested because I bought it from someone and they didn't have a test. I'm pretty sure though that it's at least 16% protein or better, probably more like 18 or more. The mineral that I feed has um, bolstered levels of calcium and vitamin E and selenium. It's, it's been custom made for these highly prolific use. So in reality, this I shouldn't have been seeing this, but I think the biggest problem was we weren't getting enough of that mineral into them, at least maybe only at half the level that they recommend. So that's something we're really working on to, to increase the nutrition, plain and nutrition for these ewes uh, going forward. Having said that, they've actually started lambing out. I think we've got uh, close to 10 lambed out so far. And really, they've all dropped twins or triplets except for one had a single, and that was Blackie. So if you've been following along with me here, you know who Blackie is. It's one of our pet sheep. Here's Blackie. So she just had a single, a really big single, somewhere around 10 to 11 pounds. And uh, she did that all on her own. So I think I've only had to help one of them so far, maybe two. And uh, really they've done a fantastic job. There's been uh, one that had proc uh, pregtoxemia or hypocalcemia, whatever the problem was, that did have a lack of milk. So we've had to leave, uh, cut her back to like a single in order to uh, make sure that she's gonna be able to feed that lamb. So the other ones went onto the machine. As a general rule for ewe lambs, I never leave more than twins on them just because we want them to finish growing out really well um, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of our standard procedure for these ewes. Um, when it came to join ill, um, just to put it in perspective, yeah, we have a bit of problem with join ill. Is it a huge problem for us? No, it's not. Um, and I hope it didn't come across that way. For the most part, any, any lambs that are left on the mother, I never, I, I would almost dare say never have a joint issue. It's just, it's just not a problem. Um, the biggest problem is when I tend to put them on the milk machine, uh, we change the environment of, you know, they're no longer getting the milk struck straight from their mother. And uh, often those lambs have been slightly compromised because they've been kind of the excess ones or the ones that haven't been doing as well. So those are the ones we pull off. So we've done some looking into that as well. Some of the reasons that we've come up to, with as to why these ones are getting joint ill and why not the ones on the mother, I think it's usually because they're not getting as much colostrum as the ones on the mothers or the ones that we've kept with the mother. So what we're going to make a point of doing is making sure that absolutely everybody gets enough colostrum, whether that be powder colostrum or whether it be the mother's colostrum. So that is probably the one biggest single factor as to why lambs don't thrive and echoes for those that are machine raised as well. So that of course, along with a lot of other common practices such as keeping clean bedding. Some of you accuse me of perhaps not bedding as well as I should have. That might be the case in a few instances. And, uh, but as a general rule, we try to make sure the lambing pens are really well bedded. Is it practical for me to dig out a one foot manure pack for every single one? Um, clean, disinfect it, and then rebed it. No, that's not practical in my situation here on my farm. For one, I am tight for space at the moment. We're trying to find ways to remedy that, but it's not practical. So our best way is to just rebed them really well. Um, and maybe we got to do a little better job of that. But uh, for the most part, I got to say, we don't have major health problems on this farm. We just have little things that pop up here and there you know you, you get a you that prolapses like 
there's probably not a farmer out there that doesn't have a ewe prolapse from one time or another uh, throughout the year. So I guess I dared to, to put it out there that we had all these problems simply because I know almost every farmer that I talk to would say, yeah, I've had that before or, you know, those kind of things. So things are going well, but yeah, we have our little thing. So just bear that in mind. I still appreciate you, you getting feedback, you know, and um, if you do, try to keep it positive. Um, you know, that's that's how we can learn. And uh, yeah, so let's, let's keep it up. And uh, I'm happy to show you what happens here, but I just hope I always get across to you the way, uh, the way I intend and that we have a good understanding. As you can see over here, um, these bottle feeds are actually doing really well now. There is still five or six in here that we're, we're battling with that joint ill problem. But all the ones that we've put in there since haven't had that problem. So whatever the case, um, things are looking good and we are pleased. We're already at this stage of the game, have more lambs in, on the ground in front of us than we had all of last year. And we've just started lambing all our ewe lamb replacements. So with almost less sheep than we had last year we have more lambs than we did all year last year that includes our fall lambing so we're super thrilled in that respect so if you're watching from somewhere else in the world other than ontario canada or probably canada and the us are fairly similar but we've got really strong prices here it's worth it some people might ask the question, is it really worth raising all those bottle feeds? And I would say it absolutely is, um, especially on years like this where the prices for sheep are really high, really strong. There's, there's plenty of margin there for raising these lambs uh, with milk replacer. I'm going to say on average, a lamb on milk replacer will cost you probably an extra $60 a lamb, somewhere around there. because. Uh, a, a bag of that stuff is about 80 to 90 dollars and they don't quite use a whole bag for each lamb so yeah i would say it's definitely worth it um realistically you might not make as much on those lambs as you would make on perhaps all your other ones but overall it's still worth it so one of the other things we seem to be having yes we have a little bit of wool slip should these uh use have been sheared I guess in an ideal world, they should have been. I don't have an insulated barn. It does get pretty cold where we live here. My problem was all these ewes were sheared last June and July. We probably should have sheared them again in October, November before it gets severely cold. But I guess at that time, you kind of feel like um, they're not long at all yet because they've only had about three or four months worth of growth. So it just kind of, I think next year across the board, we're probably going to anyone who's lambing in January to March, they're just going to get sheared in November and hopefully uh, we don't have any trouble. So yeah, our, our ewes do look somewhat shaggy. Um, some of them have lost a bit of wool. We're going to do some investigating as to, you know, is it lice here or is it uh, something else? Um, maybe it's a bit of a nutrition thing. Maybe it's the same sort of scenario. They're not getting... Uh, the mineral across the board as much as they should be so a few little tweaks and i think we'll be well on our way so we're finally getting some uh, really nice weather here where uh you know we're getting actually today i think it's wednesday afternoon and it's it's like 15 degrees celsius and uh last week we were still getting minus eight minus ten at night and i know the next few weeks we still could be getting the same so yeah, this is March in Southern Ontario. You can get plus 20 and you can get minus 10. It's just the way it is here. It's a bit like a yo-yo. Um, but right now we're loving the nice warm weather and it's actually even dry out. We're not even in the mud, so. So what we ended up doing for some of those ewes that had the pregnancy toxemia was, yes, we did treat some of them with propylene uh, glucose, but uh, for the most part, I think the problem was more of a calcium issue. 
So we did do uh, 60 mils of uh, calcium borogluconate, uh, which is kind of similar to CalMag, um, which a lot of people use. Um, I can show you the product actually, and uh, that definitely seemed to help. We also use this stuff. I've talked about it before. This is basically just uh, probiotic. That kind of got their gut going again, um, because sometimes when they go off feed, they start to uh, lose their appetite. And of course we did the vitamin uh, B. Uh, Hemostam is what we used, which is vitamin B12 along with a few other things. And uh, so between this, the cal calcium, calcium we did 60 cc under the skin in three different sites. So somewhere over the ribs and next to the shoulder is where we did it, where we were instructed to do it. We also did uh, some Distacel or Ceylon E was the same thing. For some of the listless ones, we also did a bit of dextrose right under the skin in the neck, about 10 cc. So the combination of all that stuff seems to really have helped them. Uh, most of them are back on their feet and they're at least eating again. And that's uh, kind of the biggest thing because as soon as they go off feed, things start to compound uh, the issues because of course, now they're not getting the energy they need. Now they're not getting the, the mineral and the ration anymore. So hopefully we can get through this and uh, we can prevent this from happening next time. Bottle feeds, machine fed ones are doing really good. We've got a good start on these ewe lambs. We're probably not quite a quarter of the way through. And uh, we're wrapping up the group of 180 mature ewes that have lambed. So we'll continue to keep you updated. Just uh, stay tuned and Wait for the next one. Thanks. See ya.